Good afternoon. I'm Angelica Spanos, and welcome to the Law and Crime Report, where we are diving into true crime and all legal stories making headlines today. The hearing for Justin Ross Harris wrapped up Tuesday. Harris tried to make the case that he should get a new trial. More than four years ago, Harris was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of his 22-month-old son, Cooper Harris. Cooper died after being left in the back seat of his car for over seven hours while Harris worked in a Home Depot office. Harris's lawyers are claiming that the evidence was wrongly admitted and questions during his trial were not permitted. They claim that this all led to an unfair trial. Let's listen to the defense's closing arguments. The position is there's really, there's no legal basis to turn this material over. Um, and uh, we don't think it was been contended throughout in the trial level and it's being contended now that there's really no legal basis for them to have it at that time. Um, so the store, um, the uh, state does their own in camera. And I think it's kind of ironic perhaps, but it looks like the way the evidence is presented when Dr. Diamond says that he had the handwritten notes when he went with the first interview. And that's the one it looks like uh, from my recollection of the testimony that he um, talked to Mr. Boring about then that the what actually the original motion to compel for it was the handwritten notes. That's what the state of Georgia never, um, according to the trial team, they never saw that. And um, th um, instead they got the, what really was the work product. I don't think it matters. I don't think they should have got it in either one of them, but they got the work product. And that was what Chuck Coring uh, had told the court, that's not what he wanted. Um, and it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, either one they had um, or what they were intent, or which one they wanted to get, doesn't matter. They got work product, and um, it was it was improper, and that was devastating to the. Um, and our argument is, and in, uh, in here, we the defense was not only put in a position to reveal the theory of their case and their ideas and, and um, their thinkings on certain strategy decisions or the weights of the evidence. They gave the state a work product that did include all their thoughts and their concerns. More importantly, they gave the state this huge sword just to um, stab them during trial. And uh, I'd point out that that, you know, you go back and it was dealt with a lot during the motion hearings, uh, excuse me, the motion for new trial hearing. But if you go to the second page of D1, down at the lower uh, third of that, there's some questions there that I just want to point out and have the court look at again. There were three really good attorneys at the um, prosecution table. With these three, if the state had gotten a hold of these three questions or this this document, any one of these, they wouldn't need any good attorneys uh, because all you've got to do is just look at that uh, knowledge on how to race the internet search history with a question mark more about forgotten baby slash dog history, those things would be devastating for um, the state to get a hold of and to be able to cross-examine the doctor, especially in light of those may have come from the defendant. In the hypothetical question, the trial would have been over in five minutes if that, if, if the, if that question had been presented or questioned about, and uh, especially with the answer that the doctor had, um, it looks like what would be the answer that the doctor provides here. So um, this document would not only um, chill the uh, defense of the case, it would destroy it. All right, so that's the defense in their closing arguments. With us today to break all of this down, we have Holly Davis, legal analyst, as well as Lisa Lockwood, crime analyst. Thank you both for joining us today. This uh, hearing is now done. Uh, the judge will make a decision in the near future here. But from what you've heard from the defense's closings and knowing that this has gone back and forth, he was already uh, convicted four years ago, but now he wants a new trial, Harris does. What do you make of the defense's closings and what do you think about their argument, Lisa? Coming from the police perspective, one of the things that was said in the police report is that he was very distraught upon arrival. The testimony from the police officer was that he wasn't distraught, um, he seemed to be uh, callous, there were no tears. 
the report was not used during the trial. So it didn't go into evidence for the trial to show that there was a discrepancy with the police officer who initially was on the scene when he found Cooper and Justin. So that in, in itself, that that is huge regarding what was missed first time around. And, you know, from your perspective, being, um, you know, former SWAT and all of that, and especially talking about um, the routine and the day leading up to this, we know that Harris was out of his typical order of events that day. Things were different because a meeting was pushed back and some of the memory experts that testified and some of the psychological looks at this show that he was sort of off his regular track. And that's what can lead to accidents or in this case, uh, bad things like this happening. Um, how does that play into all of this uh, with your experience? Well, it does. 54% 50, of hot car deaths are considered accidents. So what are you looking at on the, on the flip side of that? 46% are intentional. So trying to determine out of those cases which ones were intentional, one of the biggest factors is it wasn't part of the routine. The part that I have small issue with, well, actually large issue with, is the fact that they had stopped to get some breakfast sandwiches and he was holding the baby. So six minutes from the time they were leaving, getting the breakfast breakfast sandwich and him going to work, having that immediate kind of um, uh, loss of train of thought that his child was in the back seat, that's the issue that I have a problem with. So even if you were out of your routine, maybe you would have left you know, the child in the car versus taking the child out. But the fact that he did and he was photographed on video holding that child and then within six minutes, it was gone that he didn't realize his child was there and continued on to work. Absolutely. All right, Lisa, thanks. Let's move on. We want to listen to the prosecution's response to the defense. Let's listen. Honor, the court completely ruled appropriately in this case. And the reason for that is under 17.16.4, which is when the defendant shall, within 10 days of timely compliance, by the prosecuting attorney, but no later than five days prior to trial, permit the prosecuting attorney to inspect, copy, or photograph a report of any physical or mental examinations. Now, while the defense tries to claim that this is not a mental examination, that's exactly what it was because at the time they served the state, they said, this doctor is going to opine that Ross Harris did not have the intent to go ahead and commit this crime. Right to somebody's mental state, the intent or not intent. And basically, this idea that this is not a mental examination is ridiculous. Of course, it's a mental examination. The statute then goes on to say, including a summary of the basis for the expert opinion rendered in the report. In the middle of it, if the report is oral or partially oral, the defendant shall reduce all relevant and material oral portions of such report to writing. In other words, if you're going to take the stand and you're going to say, my opinion is he didn't do it intentionally, and I'm basing that on having talked to him. The next question is, well, what in the world did the guy say to you? And at that point, if he's written down, well, this is what he said to me, that's the basis of my opinion, the state's entitled to that under the statute. So the court was completely correct in saying, hand over the notes. Now, the problem becomes with the credibility of the witnesses. What we have here is we have Dr. Diamond, who shows up on August 10th, 2015 with his laptop, in the conference room at the Cobb Detention Center, Maddox Kilgore testified, oh yeah, he was over there working away on his computer. Dr. Diamond testifies, I didn't take any notes. And there's a trick with there, a trick with that. Am I taking notes during this particular hearing? Sure, on a yellow pad in my handwriting. So when I say, are you taking notes? I'm thinking you're writing things down. Other people take notes by typing it into a computer. Other people take notes by holding up a cell phone and going, here, talk into this. So when the state goes ahead and asks the court to enter an order, they're asking the court to enter an order to cover all contingencies of how Dr. Diamond might have taken notes. Because if the court says, hand over your handwritten notes, I don't have any handwritten notes. Hand over your typed notes. Oh, I don't have any typed notes. So we end up in this trap of playing word games when the state has been very, very clear all along in its motions to compel that what the state wants 
is Dr. Diamond's notes where he wrote down, this is what Ross Harris said to me, and I'm using that as the basis of my opinion as his expert at trial. It couldn't have been clearer. Chuck Boring repeatedly said this over and over again. All right, so that's the prosecution's response, and we hear them talking about the credibility of witnesses that testified during the trial and about this these notes, which came from Dr. Diamond, who was uh, the memory expert called to the stand during this, and he was also um, t called to the stand during the hearing, I believe, on Tuesday as well as Monday. So, Holly, you know, when you hear the prosecution's response, you heard the defense and what they had to say. If you had to guess, do you think that Harris will get a new trial here? I think that the trial court's going to deny the motion, and I think it's because the trial court has broad discretion in these circumstances. So basically what the defense is complaining about is that the, the objections they made at trial or the evidence they were trying to get in, um, the court did not go their way during the trial phase. And whenever the defendant's asking for a motion for new trial, that means they're asking the same trial court to overturn the decision. And, you know, really the state of Georgia ha you know, deters a lot of people from doing that. So you have to show a real abuse of discretion. In fact, I think the legal standard for the admission of the prior bad acts evidence and some of these evidentiary rulings, for example, excluding some of, uh, I think actually the, the defense made some objections or chose not to have uh, Dr. Diamond testify fully because they had to turn over their notes. And really, I think it's going to be an uphill battle for the defense simply because there's such a broad discretion given to this trial court uh, to make her rulings. And the other thing that I think is really interesting, and this is something that happens in trials all day long, you have these pros and cons of introducing your testifying experts. So if you're going to put someone on the stand that's going to say a very important piece of the case that helps the defense, then every attorney knows you have to turn over the report and the work file that goes along uh, with that opinion. That's the whole point of designating an expert opinion instead of having that person just be consulting with you behind the scenes. So I think it's really interesting and it's a tough decision for defense attorneys to make all day long about whether or not they're going to introduce an expert witness if there's damning evidence in any of those written files or audio files. So I really enjoyed listening to the prosecution's closing because it was highlighting to the court and to the public why those notes are important. And if you're going to offer that person as a, as a witness in your case, you have to explain what their notes say, too. It's the good and the bad. And one of the things we saw during this was the fact that the prosecution was trying to kind of build this case around Harris, that he had these web searches that kind of led to him having this bad behavior going on on the Internet. Um, they also were trying to say that he was, um, you know, not faithful and had all these other uh, side things going on. Do you think that they uh, had the evidence to back those up? Absolutely. I mean, this case was 22 days long. They had both, you know, over 70 witnesses total. And over 22 days, they even changed the venue to make sure that they were going to get uh, an impartial and fair jury. And so when the court allowed the evidence in of Mr. Harris's prior bad acts, sexting with eight different women, including an underage woman, um, writing down in the morning that Cooper died, writing down, you know, I love my, if it weren't for my son, I, I would totally escape this life or something along those lines. Um, and so at the trial court level, when you have that evidence that not, is not necessarily about what happened that morning, but could provide context for a motive, the trial court is um, asked to make a decision about whether or not that evidence has any probative value, meaningful, relevant value, and that that probative, probative value is not outweighed by the salaciousness of that evidence and the prejudice that that would have on a jury. And I think that because this evidence went to the motive, and that's exactly what Lisa was talking about earlier, that 56%, you know, and the remaining percentage are the people that actually did it intentionally. Because the jury was asked to walk that fine line, determining whether or not Mr. Harris intentionally did this or not, all of the evidence about whether or not he had a motive for this should definitely come in. So I think the trial court got that right. And finally, if the defense had such a problem with it over, you know, 22 days in trial and seven and, you know, at least half of the 70 witnesses, um, I think they could have fleshed that out a little bit further and talked about 
um, whether or not that evidence was true or whether or not there was bias in that. Um, and so it's a it's a tough call, but I think the trial court got it right at the trial court level about um, those prior bad acts. All right, Holly, thank you. We will have to see what happens. We're going to talk more about this case after the break. Stay with us here on Law and Crime. All right, welcome back. The back and forth continued in the Justin Ross Harris hearing for some time. The hearing spanned two days virtually, and we know that the judge is expected to come back with a final decision on January 15th. Now, during the hearing, uh, the defense alleged that the state had witnesses lie to speak to a story and a narrative that they wanted to push that was actually different than the truth. The defense even went as far as calling the prosecutor's argument a conspiracy theory. Let's listen. I can say we, uh, we do live in an age of um, expansive conspiracy theories. I, uh, the idea that this was some plot by these scheming defense attorneys is just beyond all realm of possibility to me. Um, it is clear on the record what happened. The state wanted something they couldn't get, or maybe they thought they could get it, but they tried to do it through the legal avenue. And um, also I do want to point out, there's a massive amount of speculations of what Chuck Boring knows and what he didn't know. We, and it's all just speculation, but regardless of what the record shows us is, he, has, he, he found out that there were some notes that Dr. Diamond had. There's nothing in the record of the conversation between Chuck Boring and Dr. Diamond. We don't know what uh, Chuck Boring's recollection of that hearing was, or a recollection of what that conversation was. We just have speculation on it, and uh, that speculation is devolved into this huge conspiracy that so uh to to make this into some type of a uh, conspiracy theory that the defense is trying to sabotage mr harris and get him convicted in hopes they can get for a new trial is uh a little bit far-fetched and um, you do have the evidence presented to make the consideration you have the um, evidence laid out for you what was turned over and you have a law that says it wasn't required and we respectfully ask you to grant our emotion. All right. So, Lisa, I asked Holly this in the last block, but I want to get your opinion on this, too. Do you think that there is a chance that the judge will grant this motion and give Harris a new trial? One of the pieces that the defense attorney brought up right now that I think is very important is the fact that the forensic evidence when the laptop was seized and searched did not show what was alleged and brought forward in the actual trial. And that was him searching hot car deaths with children. It was alleged that he did. Forensically, it did not show up. And I think that's a huge, uh, gross error in this case. So without that, think about that. You have a jury who is sitting there hearing evidence that he researched children dying in cars. And that was not the case. What was the case was a Reddit video had come forward about a dog dying in a car. And he looked at the video and didn't watch the entire video. So that was the real evidence. It was evidence of him looking at a video of a hot car death involving a dog, but not him actually searching within his browser. Um, how long does it take for a child to die in the car, hot car deaths with children, et cetera. And I think that's a big piece of this. So um, my thought is that potentially there is a chance for a retrial. And going off that, one of the things that the defense also, you know, pointed on was the police officer who was a witness here who, you know, they claimed didn't tell the truth in order to just fit what the prosecution wanted to say. Um, you know, having this credibility issue with the witness, especially a police officer in this case, that's kind of a huge deal, right? I believe so. And all uh, any court case I've ever seen is where they go and say, did you have an opportunity to review your report? Do you have your report there? They're reading from the report a lot of times. And the fact that it was not used in this case to me is very suspect. So why would that be omitted? Because he definitely changed the testimony based um, opposite of what his report had read. 
All right, Lisa, thank you so much. We're going to switch gears right now and get to our other headlines of the day. First up, well-known and highly trafficked adult website Pornhub removed a majority of its content. Anything uploaded by unverified users was taken down as part of a series of changes following allegations that the site had videos of child abuse and non-consensual sexual acts. The changes took the number of videos on the website from 13.5 million all the way down to a little under 3 million. Going forward now, content creators must become verified using Pornhub's process that involves uploading a picture of themselves with their username. So uh, just reading through this story off the top of my head, Holly, I'm assuming this is a, a good thing for uh, the Pornhub website, right? Absolutely, and it's a real victory for the victims of sex abuse. However, I don't think the work is done. So from basically from a federal level and from a legislative level, it looks like Pornhub was inaccurately um, analyzing a statute and, and thinking that it had broad immunity uh, in distributing these videos, many of which were um, depicting minors and uh, rapes. Um, and so it looks like they were interpreting that law incorrectly. So I'm glad that they've got that figured out now. And it looks like if we wanted to really curb the massive distribution of, of uh, porn and videos that are non-consensual and are uh, depicting child abuse, then one way to do that is to get to the online platforms and to have and to lessen their immunity. And so really that's our job and the legislature's job is to create the laws that no longer provide that protection. But Pornhub did go one step further, and it was in part based on an expose in the New York Times that was written very recently calling for the specific action. And so after they were called out in the New York Times, Pornhub changed its practice and eliminated, you know, let's see, 10 million videos from its website. And I think one of the things that needs to happen for this um, process to go forward and, and no longer exploiting these underage victims um, is for Pornhub to create more moderators. You know, what is it that Pornhub knows or should have known about those videos that were on its platform and that they were benefiting from financially? And that's a potential lawsuit as well. So if I were Pornhub uh, management, I would be very, very concerned about the potential lawsuits, which is why I think they so quickly pulled down over 10 million uh, videos from their website. That shows you the percentage of uh, videos that were part of their platform that they knew or should have known were problematic. Absolutely. And you mentioned uh, the New York Times story that kind of broke all of this. That journalist uh, was interviewed on CNN. Let's play a clip of that. This isn't about porn. This is about rape uh, and about sexual abuse of children. And on that site, there are videos of uh, unconscious women whose rapists touch their eyeballs to show that they are completely unresponsive as they're being assaulted. Uh, there are videos of young children. One of the people I spoke to was a, a girl who at 14 years old uh, had her life completely disrupted when naked videos of her were put on Pornhub and uh, she was an A student. All right. So that was the journalist basically who found that after doing an investigation that there was a video of assaults on unconscious women on Pornhub. There was also an underage uh, girl on Pornhub. So this all sort of brought this to light, Lisa. Um, what's your reaction to to the, you know, the down downsizing of the videos, and of course the the new idea that all the the creators must be verified going forward. Listen, before I was married, I was on dating websites and I needed to use my driver's license to verify who I was and show a picture. So it's all about safety. That's what it comes down to. It's not the case right now with other sites, with, you know, even the popular Facebook. And that's one of the things that Pornhub said that they have an advantage over now because social media, including Twitter, they don't have that verification process. So they're tooting their horn that now they have made these implementations and these changes in order to keep it safe. And now they're better than the other guy. Um, but to me, it's like, it, it's a little bit late for all of this. It's very unfortunate that it had gotten this far. And regarding what Holly said, having enough moderators, that's what it's about, making sure that this content isn't hasn't been uh, loaded the way it has been. How many people have been damaged over the years because of this and gotten away with it? 
So, you know, I think too little, too late. Uh, there's a lot of damage that has been done, but um, at least we're moving in the right direction. Exactly. It seems like there's a lot more work to be done as well. Lisa Holly, thank you both. We're going to take a break right now. When we come back, more of our daily news topics here on the Law and Crime Report. Stay with us. Good afternoon. Earlier today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who were preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. When I put my hand on the Bible and took the oath of office 22 months ago, I knew this job would be hard. But I'll be honest, I never could have imagined anything like this. I want to start by saying thank you to our law enforcement. Thank you to the fearless FBI agents. And thank you to the brave Michigan State Police Troopers who participated in this operation, acting under the leadership of Colonel Joe Gasper. I also want to thank Attorney General Nessel and the U.S. Attorneys Burge and Schneider and their teams for pursuing criminal charges that hopefully will lead to convictions, bringing these sick and depraved men to justice. As a mom with two teenage daughters and three stepsons, my husband and I are eternally grateful to everyone who put themselves in harm's way to keep our family safe. All right, that was Governor Gretchen Whitmer. She was announcing how an armed gang's plot to kidnap her is now all getting sorted out here. Now, recently, the extradition of one of the 14 men involved has been stalled. One of them is charged in the plot to kidnap her and he just lost a, bottle, a battle to get extra, uh, challenging his extradition. Now, his name is Brian Higgins, and he was one of the 14 people arrested. He says that because Whitmer is the reported victim of the plot, that she is a conflict of interest who should not be able to extradite, extradite him to Michigan. So the attorney general came down and said, well, he, just because she's involved in this, her involvement in the paperwork is absolutely necessary here, and it does not impact Higgins being innocent or guilty. He's accused of surveying her, her house, and uh, he faces one count of providing material support to terrorist acts as well as other charges. If he is found guilty, he could face up to 20 years in prison. So this is an interesting case here because he's not the only person involved. There's 13 other people here. Um, Lisa, do you agree with the attorney general's ruling here that uh, her involvement really does not matter here with this? Because it is her responsibility to sign the paperwork for extradition. It just so happens that she is the victim of this plot and this crime that was uh, supposed to take place against her. The person they're trying to get over is the intel guy. His job was to surveil her vacation property and provide information to the rest of the team in order to go forward with the kidnapping, the comings and goings, looking at her property and providing that information. So he's part and parcel to the entire plot. Of course, it's necessary for him to be there. And I don't see that as, as a conflict because that is her position. All right. And, and Holly, when you look at this, um, we know that of the other people charged, another one had to be had to be extradited, um, but the other people were from Michigan, I believe. So, does this particular incident could this set a precedent for the other um, suspect here that has to be extradited? I think it could, but I think this request will be unsuccessful when you and your fellow militia members. Uh, plan to kidnap and possibly kill a governor of a state in the United States of America. And you know that governors are charged with extraditing criminals to their state. You've got a bit of a problem here. And so the conflict of interest argument that's being urged by the defense and future defendants, all a part of these militia members, um, the problem that they have is that this governor is not the judge and the jury. When you attempt to kill um, an American official, 
uh, a governmental employee, a governor, then you have the full breadth of the law enforcement agency behind you that's going to um, prosecute you to the fullest. And this is not, I think it's an overreaching argument that loses the perspective of this case for uh, this defendant to claim this Michigan government governor is so biased and has such a conflict of interest here that I'm not going to get a fair trial. That's what happens when you attempt to kill a governor, a sitting governor in the United States. And so it's overreaching and overly broad because, of course, this person's going to sign the paperwork to extradite these um, suspects back to the state um, where most of the crime occurred to be prosecuted. That's the way it works. Now, could this governor have gotten someone else to sign the paperwork? Perhaps. But again, if we pan back here and we get some perspective on what this trial is really about, it's too overreaching and a waste of time, I think, to say that she shouldn't have signed those papers. Because if I were the attorney general, I would say, fine, in order to cure this, I'll get someone else to sign the extradition papers. What's the problem now? So this is a delay tactic. But I don't understand the delay tactic because this defendant's just going to sit in the county jail while he waits on his appeal. So if he'd rather sit in the Wisconsin jail versus the Michigan jail, perhaps that's a compelling reason to keep this argument up. Otherwise, I don't see what the issue is. He needs to get to Michigan and try his case. All right, Holly, Lisa, thank you. We will be keeping our eye on that. We're going to move on right now. The criminal case against a man from the popular Netflix docuseries called Cheer is continuing. Jeremiah Jerry Harris, who's 21 years old, was indicted for seven charges in an ongoing sexual exploitation case. He was first charged in September after he allegedly sought sexual images from minors and pursued sexual activities with them. All this basically going down over social media. In one of the complaints, Harris allegedly paid a minor for sexual photos. Now, the victims against Jeff uh, Jeremy Harris have spoken out. This is from an earlier interview, um, one of the victims and their mother who decided to speak out against all of this. Let's listen. My first indication that there was something going on was I found a, a series of text messages on Charlie's phone. Um, with Jerry Harris. I feel like I, I was attuned to the fact that they were friends with him, but I wasn't aware that there was something inappropriate about that relationship. That caused me to sort of delve deeper with Charlie and um, look in his Snapchat and things like that and see that there was, it was more than just text messages. All right, so that was one of the moms there. Um, this is an interesting and, and really unfortunate case here because uh, a lot of people now know this man because of the Netflix show. Um, we know that his charges in the indictment include sexual exploitation of children and transport of a minor with the intent for illicit sexual conduct. Uh, Lisa, your thoughts on this? Well, I used to work undercover many years catching sex predators on the internet who are arranging dates with underage children. So common practice, access now is higher than ever because of all the various vehicles, Snapchat being one. And that's where the initial contact came through uh, with this 13 year old, with this minor. He was 13 with the initial contact, he's 14 now. Um, also, Jeremy had contacted a 17 year old and he was paying for photographs, illicit photographs of these children in various stages of, of undress and nudity. So access is so important. I commend the mother for actually doing her job as a mother, which is looking at the activity of what their child is doing. And it needs to happen more than it actually does because this is what's happening behind the scenes. Children are being solicited for, for these photographs. Children end up killing themselves because of being threatened that these photographs will become public, just like the issues that we had with Pornhub earlier today as we discussed. So the fact that he's done this, there are multiple counts involving him soliciting pictures from these children. Um, I think that he, do he does not have a leg to stand on. All right, we'll be watching that as well. Lisa, thank you so much. We have to take a break right now. and We can map back more topics here to discuss on the Law and Crime Report. Stay with us. And welcome back. The New York City man who broke up holiday caroling and opened fire on the steps of a cathedral left a note detailing his plans 
to take hostages. Luis Vasquez was gunned down by police, but a note found in his pocket says that he would take hostages during his ploy at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine but none would be hurt unless his demands were ignored. The 52-year-old man wrote that he was going to keep the hostages unless the United States, its banks, and big companies gave him money to help those in Latin America. Police found rope, duct tape, and knives with him, along with the gun that he used to fire this off. Let's listen to the NYPD commissioner talking about his arrest. Cathedral of St. John Divine today was hosting an event, it's an annual event that they host. Thankfully this year with COVID, there was a much smaller event than normal. At about 3 o'clock, there was Christmas caroling on the steps behind me. At about 3.45 p.m., that caroling came to a close. It was at about that time at 3.45 p.m. when shots rang out from an individual, if you look behind me, right in front of those uh, massive doors, an individual firing shots. We had a police officer on the scene. We had a detective on the scene, a community affairs detective from the 2-6 precinct, almost immediately, and engaged the, perp the armed perpetrator. We also had an unrelated sergeant that was at St. Luke's Hospital, which happens to be right around the corner, immediately respond to the scene. We have a total of 15 shots fired by our three members of the service. This is preliminary at this time. We have multiple shots fired by the defendant. The defendant at this point is struck at least once in the head and deceased. He was removed to the hospital around the corner. All right. So this is obviously a very startling scene that unfolded in New York City, Lisa. Um, with your background and with your training, what happens when you have an active shooting situation like this in a public place? Oh, complete mayhem. And a lot of cases, fortunately now, because of this happening so frequently in, in the United States, is that there are security guards, there are people there who are armed in these public settings to make sure somebody doesn't take advantage of this, opportunists like this individual had done, um, having his bag nearby with his entire kill kit, kidnapping and hostage kit um, is extremely scary. Initially, when he fired, he fired into the air. He didn't kill anybody. So I don't think the intention was ever to kill anybody, but to bring awareness to his plight of what was happening in Latin America. But then ultimately, if his demands weren't met, the potential of him going forward with that, certainly he had a chance on those steps to go ahead and kill people with the two guns that they ended up finding on him. He shot in the air, and eventually, as we saw in the end, he was saying, kill me to the police officers and just wanted to end it all and completely abort the original plan. So this individual had a lengthy background, criminal background. And I also think we're probably dealing with mental health issues. All right, Lisa, thank you. Let's listen to the rest of what the NYPD commissioner said about the shooting. Again, we do not have a count on how many rounds were fired. They are both semi-automatic firearms and awaiting crime scene to process. Also recovered is a bag that we believe belonged to the defendant. Inside this bag was a full can of gasoline, rope, wire, multiple knives, a Bible, and tape. I think we can all surmise the uh, ill intentions of the proceeds of this bag. I can tell you that from the preliminary body camera, and again, this is quick, that we watched, you see three officers acting heroic, Sergeant Detective, and police officer engaging an armed perpetrator, putting themselves in harm's way to pull people that are literally hiding behind these poles behind me, caught in the crossfire. So it is by the grace of God today that we don't have anyone struck. With that, I'll open it up for extremely brief questions. Motive? Unknown at this time, obviously, we have a tentative ID, a tentative ID, and I'm joined here on my left by Deputy Commissioner Miller. Um, until we have a, a firm ID, we're not going to release any name. We are following up leads as we speak. All right, so you heard the police commissioner say that they are extremely lucky that no one was hit by any of the shots fired by the gunman. Um, Holly, coming out to you, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, as we said, you know, this might have mental health involved here, and and this man did have a a, a rap sheet and a criminal history. Yes, and I would juxtapose this situation starkly with a lot of these deadly force 
cases we've seen since the summer. Um, so this is a very different situation than um, some, you know, the Jacob Blake uh, and the and the George Floyd case. And so I'm I think that this is the definition of when officers are allowed to use deadly force when you have um, a person who is running into a crowd with an axe or a person who is waving a gun around or shooting in public. This is exactly the type of scenario where the police are authorized to use this deadly force. So I think that this is a good reminder to our um, police officers and to our community about the circumstances when deadly force is appropriate. And then also in the alternative, when deadly force is not appropriate. So I am I think that this is a perfect example of when you have to use that, the fact that it was in public, the fact that there were members of the public that could have been caught in the crossfire. And yes, I think that the victim um, and the defendant had mental health issues. It sounds like it's an ill-conceived plan. It doesn't make sense on a logic level. Uh, of course, it usually rarely does. Um, why anyone would have a general and vague idea that the banks of America would give this person money to then send generally to a country. Um, so I definitely think it's safe to, to assume that there's some mental health issues. But again, I really applaud the NYPD for following the rules for protecting the public. And I like the exposure of this case because it reminds our country about which circumstances in, uh, that deadly force is appropriate and which are not. All right. And and Lisa, you know, we talk about the deadly force uh, issue, which Holly just brought up. How does an officer, I mean, obviously this is taught in training, I'm assuming, but how does an officer know in this sort of situation when and when not to fire? In this case, you know, a public place was, was threatened here. So I'm assuming that's a big uh, threshold there. The fact that he was armed and he actually fired bullets so that was the call. We had police officers who were on scene and off duty, and then also when the call came out. So, you know, nobody's going to be in public just firing rounds. I mean, it happens on New Year's Eve occasionally, unfortunately, but in this case, it's pretty obvious. We have rounds being fired in a public area that shouldn't be happening. So it's, it's case in point. Suicide by cop is so common. This is another thing. The bystanders actually heard him saying, kill me, kill me, knowing that his entire plot wasn't going to go as planned, he decided to just basically surrender, but surrender in a sense of firing at the police officers in hopes of being killed. And it's very common, especially, again, people that have mental illness issues. And with this man, he was even yelling at the police to shoot him, uh, meaning to shoot himself, as well as uh, he said to kill me and things like that. So you mentioned mental health. That might be one of the key factors into this real quick. Right. And, and suicide by cop is, is common. And that is something that police are trained for doing their best. A lot of calls where they go out on the front porch and there's a domestic and they've got a gun and they aim it at the police. And basically they know once they aim at the police that all bets are off and they're going to be, you know, in a fury of bullets coming at them from law enforcement. And in this case, 15 rounds were fired at this individual and one of them ended up landing and being deadly. So, you know, there's nothing, there's no other recourse with deadly fire coming at you. Everybody talks about, well, what about beanbag? What about taser? What about, no, this is a man that has a gun who is actively firing. So there is no other recourse except to exchange trade fire with him. All right, Lisa Lockwood, Holly Davis, thank you both for being on the show today. Coming up next, regular scheduled programming here on Law and Crime. Thank you.